Hi, and welcome to another episode of Adulting with Hannah. I'm Hannah, here today to continue my serial killer series. If you haven't been watching this series, this is the third episode, and today we're going to be talking about Virgo serial killers. Virgos have the third most serial killers on the list I found from Killer Cloud. I've been saying the wrong website this whole time. I have no idea. I'm gonna put it in the link in the description. But today we're gonna be talking about the Virgos. I'm not covering all 39, because there are 39 serial killers listed on this website that are Virgos. Um, I'm not gonna be covering all of them, but I'm gonna be covering a lot of them. But moving forward, I think I'm just gonna do 10 <laughs> for each one because it's getting, I mean, there's more and more. And like, I'm only doing the ones that I find like very interesting or that have a lot of information because a lot of them, there'll be somebody listed, but there's not much like, oh yeah, this guy killed three people in Cuba or whatever. And there's just not much info information. So anyways, I'm gonna do 10 for each moving forward. But today we're going to cover all the ones that I did research on before. So without further ado, let's talk about some Virgo serial killers. This video does come with a content warning. We will be talking about murder, possibly sexual assault, and crimes against children. If any of these things are triggering for you, please don't watch this video. I have lots of other content on my channel that doesn't have to do with murder. So there's your content warning. Let's get into it. Okay, our first Virgo is Serhi Tkach. There's no way that's right. So he was born um, September 15th, 1952 in the Soviet Union, and he has been convicted of killing 37 women between 1980 and 2005 in the Soviet Union and some in the Ukraine as well. His main MO was targeting girls pretty young, very young. Um, the, his victims ranged from age eight to 18. He would sexually assault them, suffocate them, and sometimes sexually assault their bodies after death. The reason he was able to murder so many people is because he was actually a police investigator. Uh, he was actually able to avoid detection because of his police knowledge. Um, in 2005, he actually attended the funeral of one of his victims, and that's um, ultimately what ended up getting him caught. Um, one of the visitors at the funeral recognized him and recognized him as somebody who was with the victim whose funeral they were at uh, prior to their death. He was arrested shortly after. He confessed to killing over a hundred people and requested the death penalty. Uh, he didn't get the death penalty, but he was sentenced to life in prison for 37 of his murders. And it actually turns out there were 15 men in the Soviet Union who were wrongly imprisoned for his crimes. But he actually died in prison in 2018 at age 66 of heart failure. Next up, we have Maria Swannenberg. She was born September 9th, 1839 in the Netherlands. She was convicted of murdering at least 27 people. Um, but a lot of people think she killed as many as 90 or more. Uh, her nickname was Goi Me. I don't think I'm saying that right. Um, it, means, it means Goody Me, um, me like M-I-E, which is like, I guess, a nickname for Maria in the Netherlands. Um, and she had this nickname because she was very friendly, very amicable, was always helping her neighbors, would help the elderly, would babysit, like she just was a very helpful person. But she ended up being a serial killer, obviously, that's why she's on this list. She actually started by killing her own mother. Uh, she killed her mother in 1880 and then shortly after killed her father. Her MO was arsenic poisoning and it's estimated that she poisoned over 100 people. Um, 27 of them died and 16 of those people were her relatives. It seems like her main goal was to gain money, insurance payouts, um, inheritance, things like that. That's why she killed so many of her family members. A lot of the people that didn't die, like I said, she poisoned like 100 people, not even half of them died, but a lot of them, a lot of the survivors had many chronic health issues after being poisoned with arsenic. Um, she was finally arrested in 1885 after poisoning a family. In December of 1883, she was caught and she was sentenced to life in prison, but died in 1915. Something really creepy that she did when she murdered her victims or poisoned her victims, she would whisper in their ear. Your face is killing me. Very creepy. Uh, Richard Angelo, he was born in August 29th, 1962 in Long Island. He was actually nicknamed the Angel of Death. So Richard was actually a nurse at Good Samaritan Hospital in New York. Um, this was happening around 1989, um, and he was convicted of murdering several patients. So what he liked to do was use their IV to cause cardiac arrest by using different medications, and then he would induce a cardiac arrest and then rush in to save them because, you know, he was always nearby. He was always the hero, and he just wanted to be seen as, like, important, um, a hero, like, just needed. 
uh, things like that. But of course, a lot of them didn't survive. He didn't save them. So it turns out that around 10 people died while he was working there in incidents similar to this. He was only found guilty on two counts of murder and one count of manslaughter. And he was only 27 years old when he was sentenced to 50 years in prison. That's how old I am. <laughs> he was sentenced to 50 years to life at age 27. Um, and he is currently still serving um, his prison sentence in New York and he is 57. Next, we have another New York Virgo. I am telling you, as we go through this list, if you meet a Virgo from New York, just run, <laughs> just run away because, oh my God. Next, we have Gerald Stano. He was born in New York, September 12th, 1951. Um, he's from Schenectady, which is like so much fun to say. He is confirmed to have killed 22 women, but a lot of people think, and he claims that he's killed more like 41 women. He was actually very severely neglected as a child. He was given up for adoption when he was six months old. And at that time, doctors claimed that he was behaving at an animalistic level which is really sad. Um, he was to the point where he was eating his own fecal matter to survive. So he had basically just been ignored and severely neglected from day one. Um, he was eventually adopted by a nurse and they were a very loving family, but his trauma definitely had penetrated too deep at that point. And he had several behavioral problems from a very early age. And it was noted that he did wet the bed until he was 10. Um, he did very poorly in school. He was always a compulsive liar and he was bullied. It took him until he was 21 to graduate from high school due to his poor grades. He moved to Florida from New York after he graduated high school. He was constantly getting fired from jobs. He usually got fired for like stealing money, but he was also late a lot. And um, he says that he began killing when he was in his 20s, but um, other investigators believe that he started killing when he was more like 18, like in his late teens. He had a pretty inconsistent MO as well. Uh, sometimes he would use a gun, sometimes he would strangle his victim, sometimes he would use a knife, but he didn't sexually assault any of his victims, which is interesting. He was found guilty of nine murders and sentenced to eight life sentences and one death sentence for those nine murders. And he was executed by electric chair in 1998 at Florida State Penitentiary. Uh, for those of you weirdos like me that find last meals interesting, uh, before his execution, he ordered he ordered a Delmon, Delmonico steak, baked potato, sour cream with bacon bits, salad with blue cheese dressing, gross, uh, lima beans, and a half a gallon of mint chocolate chip ice cream with two liters of Pepsi. I'm down for all that except um, blue cheese dressing. So his final statement before his execution was that he was innocent and that um, investigators forced a false confession. Uh, here's what he said, a quote from him, quote, I am innocent, I am frightened. I was threatened and I was held for month after month without any legal representation. I confessed to crimes I did not commit. So, um, hopefully that's not true, but that is a good example of why the death penalty is so controversial because in situations like that, false confessions do happen um, due to poor investigative work or mental illness. So anyways, I'm not gonna get into a discussion about the death penalty, but there's that. Um, so if any of you have heard of the Boston Strangler case, it's a very interesting case of um, serial killer rampaging in Boston in the, in the 30s. And Albert DeSalvo is the most commonly associated person with the Boston Strangler. I highly recommend listening to a full length episode about the Boston Strangler. I think Morbid has a very good podcast episode about it. But Albert DeSalvo was born September 3rd, 1931 in Chelsea, Massachusetts. And he actually confessed himself to being the Boston Strangler, who was responsible for killing 13 women in Boston um, from 1962 to 1964. A lot of people dispute this connection and this claim for him to be the Boston Strangler. The Boston Strangler, it's still, it's a non-solved case and the people, like the crimes that have been attributed with the Boston Strangler change all the time and it's just, nobody can agree. However, there was a DNA match. So this is something that's been very interesting in the last few years is familial DNA using to solve cold cases. That's actually how they solved the East Area original Night Stalker. Um, in California, but July 2013, DNA evidence um, match was made between DeSalvo's nephew and a rape and murder case in Boston um, that linked 
uh, Albert DeSalvo to the murder of Mary Sullivan, who was attributed to being the Boston Strangler's final victim in 1964. Jumping back to the 60s, DeSalvo was actually sentenced to life in prison in 1967 for um, his crimes. He actually escaped in February of 1967 with um, a couple other inmates from the state hospital that they were being held at. So after that, he was transferred to a maximum security prison in Walpole. And it was at this time that he recanted his confession to being the Boston Strangler. So there's still a lot of doubt about whether he actually is the Boston Strangler, but from what um, I've heard about Boston Strangler cases that he's the most commonly associated with the Boston Strangler. Um, he died at age 42, so that would have been 1973, in prison. Um, he was actually stabbed to death by another inmate. They think it's gang related, but nobody was charged with the crime, but he died in prison. Next, we have Joseph Christopher. He was born July 26, 1955 in Buffalo, New York. Yes, we have another New Yorker. He's believed to have murdered 12 people um, in the early 80s, and he also wounded a lot of people during his rampage. He came from a pretty normal family. His mom was a nurse. His dad was a maintenance worker in New York. He, Christopher was an avid hunter, an avid ad outdoorsman. His dad taught him how to use guns and things like that. Teacher said he was pretty intelligent, but very quiet, kept to himself. Um, so he became a maintenance worker. Uh, similar to his father at a college in New York, but he was fired for sleeping on the job. So this is 1979 now. So it was shortly before this that he started noticing his mental health declining. And he actually went to a psychiatric center in 1980, right after he got fired from his job as a maintenance worker. Um, and he was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. So at this point he is 25, which makes sense. That's about the time that you, people with schizophrenia start showing symptoms. Um, is about at that age. So he's at the psychiatric center. It's 1980. He's been diagnosed with schizophrenia. And when he leaves the hospital, he is when he begins killing people. I would just like to insert here that schizophrenia is a very misunderstood disorder. And I highly recommend doing some research on it before you make your assumptions about this mental disorder. So Christopher begins killing shortly after he leaves the psychiatric center, like literally two weeks later. He killed three men within 36 hours with a 22 caliber rifle. And that's when he started being called the 22 caliber killer. So within four months, there are 19 deaths that have been associated with Christopher. So he was sentenced to life in prison in 1985 when he was only 30 years old, which is very young. And he died in prison in 1993 when he was only 37. Um, he actually had a rare form of male breast cancer. Next, we have Benjamin Atkins. He was born August 26th, 1968 in Detroit, Michigan. He is charged with killing 11 women. He mostly targeted um, sex workers, drug addicts, um, people living a quote unquote destitute lifestyle in the Highland Park area. He committed his crimes during a very short amount of time, a nine month period, 1991 to 1992. His MO was to torture, murder, sexually assault destitute women, uh, middle-aged destitute women in the Detroit area by luring them to an abandoned house for, I don't know, probably sexual favors or drugs. And he confessed to the murders, but claimed he was um, criminally insane due to his child abuse. But he was still found guilty and sentenced to 11 life terms for the murders. And he actually died in prison in 1997 when he was only 29 years old from HIV. Next, we have John Justin Bunting. Uh, he was born September 4th, 1966. And um, he is actually one of the three men associated with the Snowtown murders or the Bodies and Barrels murders. The, this um, series of crimes happened in South Australia in 1992, from 1992 to 1999. Um, there were 11 victims associated with the Snowtown murders and John Bunting was kind of the main guy from my limited research. Um, there's a lot of um, info on this case. It's a pretty detailed case. So I would recommend listening if this interests you to a full length episode about the Snowtown murders or the Bodies and Barrels murders. The three men associated with this are John Bunting, Robert Wagner, and James Velasquez. Um, the reason it's called the Bodies and Barrels murders is because most of the bodies were found in barrels in an abandoned bank vault in Snowtown. Um, Bunting himself was the one that made the other two guys believe that these people needed to die because they were pedophiles or homosexuals um, and that they deserved to die for their crimes. Um, well, pedophilia is a crime, but homosexual is not, you know what I mean? Um, so the victims were 
men and women all aged like 18 to almost 50. Um, one of them was um, John Bunting's own romantic partner, Barry, and another one of the victims was Velasquez's, that's hard to say, Velasquez's stepbrother, um, who was only 24. Uh, Bunting's trial lasted a really long time. It lasted 12 months, um, which is actually the longest trial in South Australian history. He was convicted of 12 murders, only confessing to three of them, and was sentenced to 11 consecutive life sentences in 2003. So that is an insane case. Um, I always find group, like, murderers, <laughs> group serial killers very interesting, um, just um, psychologically. Uh, so if that's something that interests you, I would recommend listening to a full-length episode about the Snowtown murders. Next we have Lonnie David Franklin. He was born August 30th, 1952 in LA, and he's known as the Grim Sleeper. That's creepy. Um, he murdered at least 10 people in the LA area and attempted another murder, but um, some people believe he has more than 25 victims. In May of 2016, he was convicted of killing nine women and one teenage girl. Um, he was sentenced to the death penalty in 2016, uh, but he was actually found dead in his cell at San Quentin in um, 2020, March of 2020, uh, due to unknown causes. Um, next we have Richard Beganwald. He was born August 24th, 1940 in New York, Staten Island. He's convicted of killing six people. Four of them were women and two of them were men. Um, but he is a suspect in two other murders aside from that. He was abused as a child. He had an alcoholic father and he started out early with pyromania. He actually tried to set fire to his family home when he was five and he was sent for um, observation at a psychiatric center. At that time, um, people say that he was drinking and gambling by the time he was eight years old, which is crazy. Eight? <laughs> um, he was sent to Bellevue Hospital when he was nine, um, and that was when they started using electroshock therapy on him. On a nine-year-old. Oh, I can't believe that. Um, he was placed in a school for boys, which we know what goes on there. Um, he was accused of theft. He was accused of rallying his classmates to escape from the school. He actually set himself on fire when he was 11. And by 16, he finally finished the eighth grade and was released from this school for boys. And he was sent to a public school. So I can't imagine that went over well. So after a few weeks, he dropped out of public school. Um, and that was when he moved to Nashville. And he was arrested in Kentucky for transporting a stolen vehicle across state lines. So after that arrest, he returned to Staten Island. So it's now 1958 and he's 18 years old. Shortly after he got back, he stole another car and robbed a grocery store in New Jersey. And he actually killed the grocery store owner. So this is said to be his first murder. So then he fled to Maryland. Um, he was captured two days later in a shooting because he was shooting at the police. And then he was sent back to New Jersey for a trial for the grocery store owner. And at that time he was given a life sentence. So again, he's um, 18. He was given a life sentence, but was released 17 years later for good behavior after murder. <laughs> Oh my god. So he kept a pretty low profile until he was 37. So now it's 1977. And um, at this point he was um, committing crimes again and was suspected in a rape charge and also for failing to report to his parole officer. So in 1980, he was arrested for the rape charge, but was released because the uh, victim was actually unable to pick him out of a lineup, which is really unfortunate. Um, so 1982 rolls around two years later and he actually killed an 18 year old girl in New Jersey. Um, there was no signs of sexual assault, but he did dump her body behind a Burger King, which Burger King is gross. Please never leave my body behind a Burger King. I would much prefer McDonald's, thank you. Two of his victims were buried at his own mother's house, which, ugh. who did that? Was that Ed Kemper that buried people at his mother's house? Or did, his bury, did he bury his mother at her house? I don't know, makes me think of Ed Kemper. So he was, um, after he was caught, he was sentenced to death. Um, this death sentence was commuted to four back-to-back -back life sentences. And he died in 2008 from respiratory failure and kidney fa failure when he was 67 years old. What a life. Okay, this next one, you guys, this is crazy. So this is the story of Mary Beth Tenning. Mary Beth was born September 11th, 1942 in New York. Yeah, New York, you heard me right. Dwaynesburg, New York to be specific. Mary Beth is suspected to kill, to have killed all nine of her children over the course of 14 years. Nine, 
nine of her own children. It wasn't until 1985 that she was finally convicted for the murder of her ninth child, Tammy Lynn, who was only four years old. So let's go through it. So the reason that the reason that she was able to kill all of her children without like being suspected of murder is because this is when SIDS was starting to really be researched and attributed to a lot of infant death. Um, SIDS is sudden infant death syndrome, so there's really no rhyme or reason at the time, and it's still it was at this time still being heavily researched. So everything was just getting attributed to this SIDS, and everybody just thought it was really unfortunate that all of her kids must have had some sort of defect that caused this. However, after so many of them kept happening, obviously people started investigating the deaths, and um, even after the investigation, after the fact, they were only able to convict her of Tammy Lynn's death. So starting when Mary Beth was 28, that was when the first death occurred. So this would be December 26, 1971. Mary Beth is 28. Jennifer, her daughter, died from meningitis at the hospital one week after her birth. So Jennifer is actually the only one who people don't think Mary Beth killed because she died in the hospital of meningitis. Um, however, two weeks later, their second son, Joseph Jr., he was taken to the ER um, after Mary Beth claimed that he was having a seizure um, he was stayed in the hospital for several days and they didn't find anything wrong and they sent him back home. Literally a few hours after they send him home, Mary Beth comes back to the hospital um, because he was dead from cardiac arrest. And this was in January of 1972. Fishy. Um, March 1st, 1972. So literally two months later, Mary Beth brought Barbara, her first child, into the hospital because she was having convulsions. Barbara died... Um, several hours later after being in a coma and they attributed her death to Ray syndrome, which is just like a rapidly developing like brain disease. So that's what her death was attributed to. November, 1973, so this is a little over a year later, um, Mary Beth gave birth to her fourth child, Timothy. By December, Mary Beth brings Timothy's body into the hospital claiming she found him dead in his crib. And everybody, this is when people started attributing the deaths to SIDS. 1974, her husband, Joseph, was admitted to the hospital having been poisoned by Mary Beth, but he didn't want to press charges, so nothing happened there. She had tried to poison him with a lethal dose of barbiturates. Uh, so now it's March, 1975, and they give birth to their fifth child, Nathan. And he died later that year um, while in the car with Mary Beth. So nobody really knows what happened there, but he wasn't even a year old yet when he died. So then in August of 1978, they adopted a child, their sixth child named Michael. And two months later, they gave birth to a seventh child. And her name is Mary Frances. So she was born in October, but by January, uh, Mary Beth was rushing Mary Frances to the hospital. Uh, claiming that she was having a seizure um, and the staff was able to save her, calling it aborted SIDS, which means she was about to die from SIDS, but then they saved her, I guess. However, uh, Mary Beth comes back to the hospital claiming Mary Frances is in full cardiac arrest and she died um, two days later when they took her off life support. Mary Beth's eighth child, Jonathan, he was born in 1979 and he died in March of 1980. Uh, after being on life support for one month, so he never left the hospital either. Um, February 1981, the adopted child, Michael, fell down the stairs and suffered a concussion. Um, a month later, so she brought him to the hospital for that. They released him. A month later, she brings him back to the hospital and he's dead. Um, and then lastly, we have Tammy Lynn, born August 1985. Um, and by December 20th, she was dead. And at first they thought this was another case of SIDS, but they finally started looking into it and determined that she'd actually been smothered. So everybody's like, how did this go undetected for so long? And Robert Sullivan, who is Schenectady's chief medical examiner, um, he admitted to negligence and admitted that he should have noticed the pattern sooner. No duh, Robert. So people have actually since then diagnosed Mary Beth with Munchausen's by proxy syndrome which has a different name now and I can't remember it, but if people are familiar with this, um, it's most commonly attributed to the Gypsy Rose Blanchard case, if that's something you're familiar with. It's basically where a caregiver inflicts um, medical issues on the person they're taking care of for attention or money or who knows what. A lot of people question this diagnosis in Mary Beth's case, but a lot of people 
think it is Munchausen by proxy. Anyways, she was charged with second degree murder in 1987 when she was 44 and she was incarcerated at a women's prison in New York. She applied for parole but was denied six times and was actually released on parole in August of 2018. And it's actually very interesting because her husband Joseph actually supported her this whole time. She was in prison for 31 years, but he was like waiting for her release. He was gonna be there for her when she was released. Like they're still together, even though she literally tried to poison him. So bizarre. Um, but a condition of her release is that she has to be on parole supervision for the rest of her life. And as of this video, she is 70, 78 years old, just living life. After killing nine children, Ugh, so bizarre. Next we have Kiyotaka Katsuta. Kiyotaka was born August 29th, 1948 in Tokyo, Japan. Um, he is convicted for strangling and shooting um, anywhere between eight and 22 victims. Um, and then he also committed several robberies in the 70s and 80s. He was arrested in 1983 after threatening somebody with a gun. He killed like 22 people, but they could only charge him with eight. Um, he was ex he was also suspected of sexually assaulting some of his victims, but there's no proof to substantiate this. Um, and he was actually sentenced to death and hanged in November of the year 2000 at age 52. Next, we have Paul Stephen Hay. He's also from Australia. He was born September 5th, 1957 in Victoria. He is serving six life sentences without the possibility of parole for seven murders in the late 70s. He was imprisoned originally for armed robberies in the 70s. Um, and then when he was released, he killed three people in 1978. By 1979, and he's only 21 at this time, he started killing people who thought n he knew, who he thought knew too much about his crimes. So um, he killed his associate and his associate's girlfriend. And then that girl, the girlfriend's 10 year old son, um, and then he also killed his own 19 year old girlfriend at that time. And he stabbed her 157 times, 157 times. That is unfathomable to me. Is there even enough space on a body to stab? Ugh. He was also found guilty of murder for assisting in the suicide, quote unquote, of his cellmate in 1991 when he was in prison. And he is currently serving his life sentences in Australia and is 63 years old. Next, we have Terry Blair. Terry was born September 16th, 1961 in Kansas City, Missouri. And he is serving six life sentences without the possibility of parole for killing seven people. But police do think he had more crimes. He actually had 10 siblings, which is a lot. And his mother suffered from mental illness, unfortunately. Um, and his mother actually murdered her common law husband um, when Terry was only 17. So that happened in 1978. By 1982, Terry is 21 years old and he murdered a pregnant mother of two. He said he murdered her because he was angry with her for being a prostitute. He was sentenced to 25 years in prison at that time, but served only 21 years. And he was released on parole in the year 2004. Almost immediately, he began sexually assaulting prostitutes, murdered six more women between the ages of 25 and 58, all within a very short period of time in 2004. By October of 2004, he was charged with six counts of first degree murder, and he's currently serving his life sentence in Missouri, and he is 59 years old. Harrison Graham, born September 9th, 1959, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He is serving a life sentence for the murder of seven women. It is believed that he had an intellectual disability due to his poor school performance, but his mom claimed that he had a mental illness that caused him to serve two years in a psychiatric facility, but there's no record of this. He actually dropped out of school after 10th grade. Um, he had really bad grades and a lot of absences at that time, so he ended up just dropping out. And by the 70s, um, he was actually developing a pretty good reputation in the construction industry. He eventually got an apartment and he would sell drugs out of his apartment. Um, he was never violent and was eventually living off his disability pension at that time. Um, his neighbors described him as nice and friendly, just, you know, the local drug dealer. By 1987, his neighbors started complaining about an odor coming from his apartment. And we know where that always ends up going. So his landlord was asking him to leave the premises 
on August 9th. Um, Harrison refused to let anybody in and eventually started boarding up the front door when his landlord was trying to get him to leave. So he boarded up the front door and then grabbed a few things and fled down the fire escape of his apartment. So the landlord called the police to break into the apartment because he had boarded up the door and when they got in, it was a horrifying sight. So inside Harrison's apartment, they found the naked corpse of a woman. They found a partially dressed corpse of another woman. Um, they found obviously a lot of drugs, um, some blood everywhere. They said that the entire apartment had like two feet of trash just coating the entire apartment throughout. There was a lot of dirty mattresses. They found a full human skeleton. They found more skeletized remains in the closet. Um, they found the bones of different hands, feet, um, legs of different bodies were found in duffel bags. So the two bodies that were not quite so decomposed as the other ones, the cause of death was determined to be strangulation. And it was actually a few weeks that he was able to evade the police, but eventually his mom convinced him to turn himself in. So the two bodies that they saw first when they walked in of the women, um, it was determined that they had been killed sometime within the last 10 days, but the other five of the skeletized remains had been killed somewhere between like six to 12 months previously. Um, the women were aged 22 to 36. Um, one of them was um, Harrison's girlfriend. Um, during the trial, his lawyer tried to argue that he was incapable of determining right and wrong due to an intellectual disability, and then his drug use was what made him paranoid and caused him to kill people. By 1988, he was found guilty on all charges of murder and received six life sentences. After his trial, his only request was that he had his Cookie Monster toy returned to him, which was one of the only things he took when he fled, so that was very important to him. Um, he is currently still serving his sentence in Pennsylvania and he is 61 years old. Next, we have Norbert Polk. Norbert was born September 15th, 1951 in West Germany. He was actually a German police officer who convicted who committed several bank robberies starting out, but he also committed six murders. So his MO was to carjack people. He would murder them, steal their car, and then use their car to rob a bank. Um, this earned him the nickname the Hammer Killer because he would usually use a sledgehammer in his crimes, which in German is Der Hammer Murder. <laughs> I'm probably saying that wrong, but it sounds really cool in German. The police began closing him in on him as a suspect, and as a police officer, he was very embarrassed to have been committing all these crimes, and his colleagues were like onto him about it. So instead of just fessing up, he actually decided to um, commit family murder and then suicide. So he killed his wife, his two sons, and then himself in October of 1985 when he was only 34 years old. After the murder suicide, it was determined that it was his personal police pistol that was used in the murders and I mean obviously nothing came of it because he was dead but it was determined that he was the one that committed the crimes and unfortunately decided to take the lives of his family as well. Aaron Komsinki, he was born September 11th, 1865 in Poland. He is one of the people that is very strongly associated with the Jack the Ripper crimes that happened in England in the 1880s. So almost everybody knows about Jack the Ripper and um, Aaron Komsinki is the most strongly associated person with these unsolved crimes. Um, Jack the Ripper is associated with murdering 11 women in London between 1888 and 1891. Komsinki actually moved from Poland to London in the 1880s, so it makes sense that he could have been committing these crimes. Um, Russell Edwards wrote a book um, claiming that Komsinki is Jack the Ripper, um, and this book was published in 2014 and is called Naming Jack the Ripper, so if you're interested, you can read that book. Next we have Raul Ocio. Maroquin. Raul was born in Mexico September 1st, 1980. When he was 25, he actually kidnapped six men and killed four of them between September to December of 2005. Um, he typically targeted homosexual men that he met at gay bars in the area, and his MO was to repeatedly suffocate and resuscitate his victims until they eventually died, which is horrifying. <sighs> He would kidnap these people and hold them for a period of time and actually ask his family, he would ask the victim's family for ransom, but eventually would never return them and, and kill them anyway, but would get money out of them. He would often um, dispose of the bodies by scattering their remains throughout the city, so a lot of the time their remains were never found. 
Um, he was sentenced to 300 years in prison in 2008. I kind of like that better than saying like back-to-back -back life sentences. Like in Mexico is like, no, literally like 300 years. I'm like, fair. <laughs> Here's what he said when he was arrested. He said, I do not regret what I did. If I had the opportunity, I would do it again. Only I would be more careful to not get caught and not commit the same mistakes that led to my capture. The only thing I regretted was what is happening to my family now. And he is serving, serving his sentence in Mexico City and is currently 40 years old. Next, we have Susan Bear Carson. This is an interesting one. Um, this is a killer couple situation, which I always find very interesting. Susan was born Susan with an S in September, on September 14th, 1941. She married James Carson somewhere between 1977 and 1980. Um, she changed her name to Susan with a Z. <laughs> Really weird. They were very into drugs, um, mysticism. They believed like there's an altered state of consciousness where you can get the world's answers. Um, a lot of people believe that you can be closer to God and you can see the hidden truths of the world. It's like very, which is fine, but it, they kind of went, you know, James had been married before he married Susan and his first wife actually feared for their for her life and her daughter's life. He she believed that James was going to kidnap um, their daughter and because at this time he had gone through a severe behavioral change and so they left and um, by 1980 James and Susan were together and they had moved to San Francisco. Um, she was 39 at this time 1980. By 1981, they had a roommate, Karen. She was only 23. Um, she was found dead in their apartment, and it turns out that she had been stabbed 13 times and her skull had been crushed, and she was wrapped in a blanket and they, and they hid her in the basement. Um, James and Susan were obviously the prime suspects, but they had disappeared. So later after they had been caught, they claimed that the reason they had killed Karen was because they believed that she was a witch. So after they killed Karen, they went to Grands Pass, Oregon. Um, they hid literally in a mountain <laughs> until 1982. And then they moved to Alder Point, California and began working on a marijuana farm. Um, according to their coworkers, they were definitely like anti-establishment anarchists. They believed um, there was going to be a nuclear apocalypse. They just had all these really out there ideas. They were calling for like a major revolution to prevent this like nuclear apocalypse. By May of 1982, James had actually shot and killed one of his coworkers. Um, he was trying to burn the body and bury it in the chicken fertilizer so that the chickens would eat it, um, but that plan didn't really work. So they fled. They literally left everything behind, including a manifesto, which was calling, which among other things was calling for the assassination of the president who was Ronald Reagan at the time. So by November of 1982, James was picked up in LA because somebody saw him and recognized him. He was detained for a short period of time, but was released due to a police error, which I don't know what kind of police error releases a prisoner, um, but he was able to flee uh, police custody due to this error before he was ever questioned. Um, by January of 1983, they were hitchhiking near Bakersfield, James and Susan, um, near Bakersfield, California, and were picked up by a man named Charles Hellier. Susan decided that Hellier was also a witch and that he needed to be killed. So James um, got Charles to pull over the car and they fought um, inside the car and then outside the car. Um, and Susan ended up stabbing him and James also got a hold of a gun and shot him after that. And literally there are like people driving by. So people are like, um, they're like murdering that guy. So uh, obviously people called the police. James and Susan got back into Charles's car and um, were fleeing and like trying to escape police, but they eventually crashed the car and were arrested. James and Susan confessed to three murders at the press conference, but withdrew their confessions later. Um, Susan received a sentence of 75 years to life and is serving her sentence in California, and she is currently 79 years old. Next, we have Graham Young. Graham was born September 7th, 1947 in England. Uh, when he was 15, he was sent to a hospital um, in the year 1962 because he was poisoning several of his family members. Um, and he actually ended up killing his stepmother. So they obviously believed he had some sort of mental illness. Um, he was released from Broadmoor in 1971. 
He poisoned seven more people and killed two of them. Um, he was sent to prison for a life sentence in 1972 when he was only 25, but died when he was 42 of a heart attack in the year 1990. I think that's interesting because I, you don't hear many men that poison people. I feel like it's typically something that women do. Um, I think like psychologically women tend to do like to murder people by like poisoning or things that aren't like messy. I don't know what it is, but like women don't like, anyways, I don't wanna get into it. Uh, next we have Jack Spillman, born August 30th, 1969 in Spokane, Washington. He is known as the werewolf butcher, horrifying. Um, he is convicted of killing three women. They were Rita, who was 48, her daughter Mandy, who was 15, and a little girl named Penny, who was only nine. Rita and her daughter were found sexually assaulted and posed in a provocative position in April of 1995. Um, Spillman's truck was associated with a truck that was seen in the area the night of the murder. Um, that car had also been stopped in the area by police that day before the murders took place, or possibly after, I guess, sometime that evening. Penny had been killed in a similar way the year before, which is how they were able to associate Spillman with that murder. He was, uh, he was threatened with the death penalty unless he confessed to Penny's murder, so he did. He told his cellmates after he was incarcerated that he was one, he was, his plan was to become the world's greatest serial killer. And he also had a really long history of sexual assault, robbery, and burglary before his crimes. Uh, he was sentenced to life in prison in 1996 and is currently serving his sentence at Washington State Penitentiary and he is currently 51 years old. Brian Dugan was born September 23rd, 1956 in Nashua, New Hampshire. He has four siblings who were able to report on his childhood saying that his parents were alcoholics. He had a very traumatic birth. He was arriving before the doctor was there and so the nurses decided to push him back inside of his mother and strap her legs together which is not a great idea at all. Um, so his family strongly believed this caused some severe brain damage. He had always suffered severe headaches as a child, frequent like vomiting, nausea, just head issues um, from a very young age. Um, and he was actually a chronic bedwetter and it was actually um, noted that his father was also a chronic bedwetter as a child. And he started showing symptoms of psychopathy, psychopathy psychopathy from a young age. A lot of child specialists at the time didn't really understand the symptoms, so they didn't really attribute it with these later, like with what could happen later in his life. Um, when he was eight, he burnt down the family garage. Um, by 13, he had poured gasoline on a cat to set it on fire. Um, he was arrested for the first time in 1972 when he was 16 for burglary. He also claims that at that same time he was being molested by John Wayne Gacy, which is really interesting. Um, investigators don't believe this claim because Gacy apparently was not known to be in that area at that time. And um, Dugan's claims of the events don't really match John Wayne Gacy's MO. So a lot of people don't believe him, but he did claim that he was being sexually assaulted by John Wayne Gacy at this time. He was arrested many times for different things like arson, assault and battery, things like that. Um, Brian's younger brother claims that Brian attempted to molest him at one point um, when Brian had returned from a youth home. Um, his family also believes that he was sexually assaulted while he was at this youth home, which is why he came home and tried to sexually assault his brother. When Brian was 18, he attempted to abduct a 10 year old girl from a train station. For whatever reason, the charges for that were eventually dropped. And in 1975, he was starting to threaten his family. He had threatened his older sister, um, threatened to kill his older sister and chop up her son. He murdered three people between 1983 and 1985. Um, one of them was a 10 year old little girl named Janine Nakar Nakariko. She was abducted from her home in February of 1983. She was actually home alone because she was sick with the flu and her parents had to go to work. So he broke into her home and abducted her and um, he sexually assaulted her and beat her to death. He murdered 27 year old Donna Schnorr. She was murdered in July of 1984. Um, he followed her home one night, she was driving home. He followed her home, ran her off the road. Uh, he sexually assaulted her, beat her and drowned her in a nearby quarry. And then he would go on to murder eight year old Melissa Ackerman. He abducted her while she was riding her bike with a friend. The friend was actually able to escape. Um, he tried to abduct both of them, but one of them escaped. Um, and he assaulted and killed Melissa and drowned her in a creek as well. 
Dugan's death sentence was commuted to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and he is currently 64 years old, serving his time at the Stateville Correctional Center in Illinois. Next, we have Paul Michael Stephanie. He was born September 8th, 1944 in Austin, Minnesota. He is known as the Weepy Voiced Killer, and this is a very interesting set of crimes in which he committed crimes and then would call and report it to the police. And the reason he's called the Weepy Voiced Killer is because he would like talk in a really weepy, really weird voice. This is an interesting case that I highly recommend you listen to a full length episode on and you can find a great episode on the weepy voice killer on Morbid Podcast. Next we have Louise Pete, and I'm again going to direct you to a podcast for this one and it is actually my own podcast, Fluff Stuff. I covered Louise Pete on our most recent episode. She was born September 20th, 1880 and it's a really wild one and I want you to hear the whole story but I'm not gonna cover it here because we would be here forever. But um, if you want a really twisty turny story, I would highly recommend going to my podcast and listening to the episode on Louise Pete and I will link it in the description box. Next, we have Paul Kenneth Bernardo, who I'm not going to attribute any more time than I need. He is the wife of Carla Homolka, who I covered in a previous episode. And he brutally tortured and murdered three young girls, including Carla's own sister. They tortured and murdered these girls together. They are known as the Ken and Barbie killers. I hate them. Um, he is currently serving his sentence and he's 56 years old and I hope he rots in hell. Next, we have Peter Tobin, born August 26, 1946 in Scotland. Peter Tobin is strongly associated with being the Bible John serial killer. Bible John killed three women in Glasgow in the 60s. A lot of people believe it was Peter Tobin, but he denies any connection. Tobin is serving a life sentence for murdering three women between 1991 and 2006. Um, their ages was tw were 25, 15, and 18, and his MO was sexual assault followed by stabbing. And he is currently serving his time in Edinburgh, and he is 74. The Bible John case is a very interesting case as well, and I believe you can find a full-length episode on Bible John on the Morbid Podcast. They are not telling me to tell you guys this. It's just one of my favorite podcasts, and they do a great job. But um, if you want any more details on the ones that I'm mentioning on Morbid Podcast, they do a great job covering these cases. Next, we have have Marie Fikakova. She was born September 9th, 1936 in the Czech Republic, and she is accused of murdering newborn babies. She was a nurse at a maternity ward, and she would beat babies over their heads to murder them. She was charged with two murders of newborns, but she is known to have killed at least 10 from 1957 to 1960, and she was sentenced to death by hanging in 1961 at age 25. Next, we have Carol Bundy. Carol was born August 26, 1942. Her parents were alcoholics. Her mother died when she was very young, and after that, her father started abusing her when she was only 11. When her dad remarried, he didn't want to be a dad anymore, so he put Carol in a foster home. So she spent a lot of her childhood in foster care. By the time she was 17, she had married a 56-year-old man. She eventually divorced him, uh, married another man, and that was a very abusive marriage. And at this point, she is 37 when she meets Doug Clark. She had just left her third very abusive marriage and started dating Doug, who she soon found out had very similar dark sexual fantasies to her. Her partner, Doug, started bringing home prostitutes um, and they would have threesomes. And then he started eventually acting out his fantasies of pedophilia and took an interest in their 11-year-old neighbor. Bundy actually was the one who helped lure the 11-year-old girl into their home um, and convinced her to pose for pornographic photos for Doug to use later. And then Doug's fantasies quickly escalated from pedophilia to murder. He started telling Carol that he wanted to kill someone during sex. She purchased two guns for him to use in these fantasies and at the time admitted to feeling sexually aroused by the thought of seeing him kill people. Doug would go on to kill teenage girls along the Sunset Strip and would end up telling Carol all about these crimes. One time he actually ended up bringing back the head of one of his victims and kept it in the fridge. Um, Carol would eventually um, use the head and um, put makeup on it and get it all cleaned up for Doug to use later. Sorry, that makes my stomach hurt. Ugh. By 1980, Carol was starting to, I guess, feel guilty maybe or have a lot on her conscience because she would confess these crimes to um, a singer that she had actually had relations with. His name was Jack Murray. 
And so she confided all these crimes to Jack that she knew that Doug was committing, that she helped commit, etc. Obviously Jack was like, what the hell? And said that he wanted to tell the police about this because it was obviously something that the police needed to know about. So Carol was like, oh yeah, um, why don't we just go back to your van real quick? So she lured him back to the van promising him like sex or whatever and ended up shooting him and then cut his head off. She ended up confessing to the murder two days later to her coworkers and her coworkers called the police. Um, Carol would confess to her crimes and Doug's crimes to the police. She also confessed to another murder other than Jack's that she um, said she committed shortly after she bought the guns for Doug. Um, but we still don't know who that person is, it's unknown. Doug was charged with six murders and for whatever reason decided to serve as his own defense, which I'm sure that went over really well. Um, but basically what he was trying to do was convince the jury that Carol and Jack were actually the ones that committed the crimes. Doug was sentenced to death in 1983. Um, he still remains on death row in California. Uh, Carol was sentenced to 25 years for killing Jack and 27 years for the other murder. And she died in prison at age 61 in the year 2003 from heart failure. So those are all the Virgo serial killers that we will be discussing today. I will put the link to the article that I'm using for the list of serial killers by Zodiac sign in the description box, as well as links to the podcast episodes that I mentioned that I suggest you listen to in relation to these crimes. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you guys aren't already aware, my interest in serial killers and murderers is definitely from a psychological standpoint. Um, so my plan at the end of this series is to compile some data about um, different MOs and childhood traumas and um, previous crimes from all of these serial killers and then see if there's any association with types of crimes or childhood trauma that is associated with a zodiac sign if there's any sort of impact so this is kind of more of a research thing but i'm just kind of sharing my information as we go so at the end of the series after we do all the zodiac signs there will be a big data collection video so i hope you guys stick around for that and also check out my channel for other types of videos that are non-murder related because there's lots of content on there and i hope you guys subscribe and join me next time bye